This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Saturday, May 25th, 2019. I'm Caleb Brown. In criminal justice reform, focusing all or most of our attention on mandatory minimums or absurdly long sentences for nonviolent crimes obscures an important element of the system. In Alexandra Natapov's new book, Punishment Without Crime, she takes a deep dive into the misdemeanor system, how it punishes behavior, and what it should exist to accomplish. So a misdemeanor is a, is essentially a low level offense. The crim uh, the the legal definition tends to be any offense for which you can serve no more than one year incarceration. Uh, although even that definition varies, there are three four year misdemeanors where people serve longer periods of time than that, and often low level felonies are sentenced much like misdemeanors. Um, but the technical definition doesn't really capture the variety and depth of the phenomenon. In, in effect, we have an enormous world of low-level offenses. Sometimes we call them misdemeanors. Sometimes we call them violations. Sometimes we call them ordinances. Sometimes uh, we call them petty offenses. They go by all kinds of names. They can be punished uh, by a maximum of a year, six months, a few months, weeks, days. Sometimes people go to jail for them up front. More often, they don't. Uh, they're punished more frequently by probation and a fine. And the idea is that there's this enormous world of low-level conduct that we punish criminally through all these different vehicles that we will collectively call misdemeanors that permits the criminal law uh, system, the criminal law apparatus to extend enormous influence over millions of people every year for relatively unremarkable conduct. So uh, when people think of a uh, misdemeanor, they think not that serious, uh, as as you mentioned. But, you know, even a week in jail, uh, many people would lose their jobs over something like that for conduct that, as you say, is is uh, is is not that serious. These are not considered to be serious crimes. Yes. So that's really the great divergence, sort of the great uh a problem in the misdemeanor world that it is an it it is a criminal justice um, operation that proceeds on the assumption that these crimes are minor and the punishments are petty for the people who sustain them, and if that has ever been true, it is no longer the case. Uh, people who have a brush with the misdemeanor system, and, and I say brush because often these cases do not result, uh, result in a conviction. Many people get diversion, diversion programs or um, uh, other kinds of informal treatments that can still be devastating. Uh, many people spend a significant of time incarcerated prior to to an adjudication prior to trial because they can't make bail, as you just referred to. So people are spending days, weeks, even months in uh, incarcerated before their cases have even been resolved. Uh, people are sustaining enormous debt, uh, crushing debt from fines and fees that they often cannot pay, which ironically can result itself in incarceration, uh, incarceration for failure to pay. It also means that they don't have money for other things in their life, for rent, for housing, for Healthcare can ruin their credit. Uh, perhaps most famously, a misdemeanor conviction can interfere with your employment prospects for your life. These are these these convictions don't go away. They dog you know they dog you for as long as a felony conviction. In other words, there are all kinds of burdens, punitive burdens that begin before your case starts and can outlast the case and the sentence itself. And so. Uh, misdemeanors really aren't petty. They really aren't minor for the people who sustain them, even though we've permitted an entire system to grow up in a kind of fast and sloppy and informal way around the assumption that these are no big deal. So uh, describe to me some uh, misdemeanors for which people go to jail that, uh, in your view, just don't qualify as something somebody ought to go to jail for. So the world of misdemeanors uh, is enormous and diverse, just worth getting a little bird's eye view of what we mean by the misdemeanor system. So so uh, as, uh, as a result of research that I did for this book, I estimate that approximately 13 million misdemeanors, uh, misdemeanor cases are filed in this country every year. That's about four times the size 
of the felony docket. Bet- between about three and four million state felonies are filed every year. 80% of our uh, criminal dockets are misdemeanors. That means this is really what our criminal system does most of the time to most people. Uh, and so, therefore, it encompasses a vast range of conduct. So a misdemeanor can be as serious as domestic violence or drunk driving, and it can be as minor as jaywalking, spitting, and in 25 states, speeding. So we're really talking about the full gamut of uh, low-level conduct, some of which uh, you know, tends towards the end of the, sp- the more the more harmful or dangerous or sort of classically criminal end of the spectrum, and some of which most people don't think of speeding as a crime at all. And yet, technically, in half of states, it is. And then every state, every jurisdiction, every locality handles those misdemeanors differently. So in some jurisdictions, you're unlikely, uh, uh, you're largely unlikely to ever think about jail in connection with a speeding ticket. But in Mississippi, People who get speeding tickets are routinely threatened with 10 days of jail time, which is the maximum sentence for speeding, uh, as an inducement to pay their fines, a kind of a, a kind of the, the stick to get people to pay. Um, some jurisdictions, uh, individuals with uh, DWIs face incarceration as a routine matter, and some they don't. Uh, and everything in between. So, so the... Uh, as an empirical matter, there's there's still a great deal we don't know about our misdemeanor system. But what we do know is that 11 million people pass through American jails every year, mostly for misdemeanors. Uh, the majority of criminal cases that contribute to our bloated criminal system, that contribute to the that the the front gate of mass incarceration, if you will, they're misdemeanors. And so the size and the punitiveness and the harshness of our misdemeanor system. Uh, of our criminal system starts with misdemeanors. It, it might be tempting to say, well, why don't we just make a, a whole host of these misdemeanors into something for which you just pay a fine? But of course, if you're talking about uh, low income people who are disproportionately affected by misdemeanors to begin with, that isn't necessarily a very workable solution to to keep people out of jail and keep people engaged with their with their homes, with their jobs, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's such a tricky point. So, so that's really what decriminalization is, and it is—it's uh, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, as you point out, uh, taking jail off the table, converting low-level offenses into civil citations or non-jailable misdemeanors, where people can't be incarcerated up front, but are only—and I say that in scare quotes, quote unquote—only faced with a fine or a fee. Uh, is less punitive. It it does move us away from the mass incarceration model. It does put fewer people in jail, which, as you point out, can be a devastating and dangerous experience. So, on the one hand, decriminalization is a is a very powerful tool in our reform quiver. And yet, on the other hand, as you also point out, um, for for poor and working and low income individuals for whom $500 uh, is not something that they can pay immediately or even easily over time, in many ways, we haven't taken incarceration off the table. We've merely postponed it. Because all too often, as we have now seen, uh, individuals who cannot pay their fines and fees are eventually incarcerated, not for the underlying offense, not for the reckless driving, not for the marijuana possession, not for the trespassing, but for failure to pay the fines and fees that accompanied that offense. And so the answer is not to, I think, to give up on decriminalization. It's it's the right direction. It's it's uh, many crimes I think would be benefited from decriminalization. But to understand that it is this double-edged sword and to make sure that we don't convert this um uh this uh, what, what we want to serve as a progressive criminal justice reform in uh, sort of covertly into this regressive taxation mechanism. So what is the purpose of the the misdemeanor system? Obviously, it's to uh, to deter some kinds of disfavored uh, behavior or some kind of violation of of property that that we uh, we want to take seriously. But does it go beyond that? So I'm going to split up your question. What should the misdemeanor system be for and what is it actually for? Um, I think what the misdemeanor system should be for 
is what our criminal system should be for, which is a democratically accountable, law-bound mechanism um, for keeping communities and families and individuals safe, for sending a message about what is and is not dangerous and harmful behavior, and for providing a way for the government to intervene when individuals and communities or workplaces need um, need that very powerful coercive power of the state on their side. No one should have to worry, uh, you know, that their stuff is going to get stolen from their car. Nobody should worry that they're going to be subject to um, assault, even if, you know, even low level simple assault, which is treated, you know, treated as a misdemeanor businesses, you know, shouldn't um, have to worry that, the, you know, that shoplifting is is not going to be dealt with. At the same time, what our misdemeanor system has indeed become, what it is in practice for, uh, has become enormous. We use the misdemeanor system to do all kinds of work that is not that is not tightly tied or sometimes completely divorced from from public safety. We use it to uh, enforce gentrification boundaries. We use it to manage the homelessness population. We uh, and people with substance abuse problems or mental health disorders. We use the misdemeanor system as a productivity measure for police. Uh, many police departments tell us that they they can't get promoted. Uh, police tell us that they can't get promoted within their departments if they don't meet an informal arrest quota for misdemeanors. Uh, in, in, ef- in effect, we've permitted misdemeanors to become a performance metric, uh, divorced from whether those those arrests should ever take place. And perhaps uh, you know most infamously these days, most troubling. We've permitted the misdemeanor system to become a taxation mechanism, a, a way for localities and states and courts and um, uh, criminal justice institutions to raise money off of the backs of the vulner- uh, sociologically and economically vulnerable people who pass through the system. So, so to ask what the misdemeanor system is for is really to ask what should it be for and how can we narrow um, and reduce the the sprawling social policy of misdemeanor um, misdemeanor processing from what it has become uh, into m- more closely to what it should be. Uh, I know libertarians have a lot of criticisms about how governments, particularly the FBI, uh, gathers data about uh, crimes, uh, in particular uh, the euphemism police-involved shootings. But uh, what do we not know and what should we know about the misdemeanor system that we don't know right now. Uh, don't get me started on what we don't know. <laughs> uh, in in preparation for writing this book several years ago, uh, I realized that there was so little public data on just the very basics of the American misdemeanor system. How big is it? How many cases are filed? What kind of cases are filed? Who gets swept up into the system? And so I embarked on a data collection project uh, which the the result of which is contained in the book, and the, the appendix gives um, g- gives all the you know links and and references to all the data that I found. But in a nutshell, I found that approximately thirteen million misdemeanor cases are filed in this country every year. That was an, a number that we didn't know before. But that every jurisdiction keeps that data differently, and that drilling down any farther than that is extremely difficult. So, for example, I sent a data request to every single state, to to the administrative office of the court in every single state, and asked them, how many misdemeanors does your state file every year? Uh, To my knowledge, no one had ever done this before. No one had ever asked that question of every single state. And the answers I got were wildly divergent. Some states gave me pretty robust data, with even with breakdowns of their misdemeanor dockets into what sorts of offenses were filed. Some states uh, never got back to me at all. I never heard back from Oklahoma. I never heard back from Tennessee. Some states told me they didn't have the computer infrastructure to uh, sort the misdemeanor data in the ways that I had requested, that that their computer systems were too outdated to do that very basic empirical work. So yes, there are myriad criticisms of the way that data is deployed and used and um, uh, and collected in the criminal system. But in the misdemeanor world, the problem is lack of data. And so one of my my hopes is that shining a light on the misdemeanor system will will um, 
uh, support people to put more pressure on our misdemeanor systems, all those thousands of local offices, to produce more public data so that the American public can know how 80 percent of its own criminal justice system actually works. In terms of trying to uh, understand uh, you know, why this is an important uh, avenue for study and uh, potentially reform, what do we know about the breakdown of enforcement or the, the disparate nature of enforcement in misdemeanors? Yes. So you you phrased the question correctly, what do we know? Because there is so much about the misdemeanor system that we don't know. Uh, but based on what we do know, we, we, we see a, two, uh, at least two very disturbing trends, which is the criminalization of poverty and the racialization of crime. And what I mean by that is that much of the misdemeanor system goes after people and conduct uh, that is only engaged in or uh, only affects the poor. So that perhaps the most uh, dramatic example is driving on a suspended license. For most people, driving on a suspended license is a crime of poverty. Their license is suspended because they couldn't pay a traffic fine. They can't get to work, they can't get to school, they can't get to the doctor without driving, and so they drive on a suspended license, and now they have a misdemeanor. In some jurisdictions, as much as 60% of the docket are driving on suspended license misdemeanors, it, it, and not everywhere, but in some places, it, it is just an overwhelming percentage of what it is the misdemeanor system is doing. And of course, that is going to disproportionately affect low-income individuals because the wealthy can afford to pay the traffic ticket. They're not going to get suspended licenses for reasons due to, um, due to poverty or being low-income. But it could happen to anyone. It could happen to anyone who's between jobs. It could happen to anyone who's a student. It could happen to anyone who, for whatever reason, can't pay a traffic ticket or or misses a, a, a court date and has an outstanding warrant for, um, for appearance. There's so many ways driving is so fundamental and so pervasive an aspect of our life, of our economy, and yet we permit it to be regulated through the criminal system in this in this caustic and, and undermining way. So we could stop doing that. Um, and, and in a similar way, we have seen time and time again that policing, that, that uh, low-level uh, policing is disproportionately focused on low-income com communities of color, that African-American men are disproportionately arrested, for example, for order maintenance crimes like disorderly conduct and loitering and trespassing. Uh, jaywalking turns out to be a particular culprit. We see in jurisdictions around the country that African Americans are two, three, five times as likely to be arrested for jaywalking um, as uh, as white people are. Of course, marijuana has become infamous um, for it for the racial disparities in its enforcement. And so, because the low level offense machinery is so enormous. And it's the first point of contact between so many individuals in the criminal system. This is really where the disproportion in our criminal system begins. It's the beginning of the racialization of crime, where the misdemeanor system is literally reaching out and choosing to sweep people of color, African Americans in particular, into the criminal system for conduct that so many people engage in and yet will never, uh, will never suffer criminal consequences. To the extent that so many people are uh, find themselves on the wrong side of the law with respect to our a misdemeanor system, that would seem to confer a great deal of leverage to police in trying to investigate other crimes. D is, does that work in practice? I think the takeaway from from examining the role of police in the misdemeanor system is to recognize just how powerful that policing role becomes when we criminalize so much common conduct, that almost anyone can commit a misdemeanor easily. Uh, we, we probably all committed one in the last month or so. It's easy, it's easy to loiter or litter or spit or jaywalk or trespass. Um, and what we have done, be, because the misdemeanor adversarial process is so enormous and fast and sloppy because we don't really check those arrests, we have, in effect, given police the power to determine who we will label a criminal, who will sustain a criminal conviction, who will be pushed into the full-fledged criminal system with jail and fines and fees 
merely because they have the power to arrest, because they get to decide who will be arrested for these low-level offenses. And, we, and, and policing was never intended to be the be-all and end-all determinant of who sustains a criminal conviction, who goes into the system. That's really supposed to be the prosecutor's job. That's supposed to take place in an adversarial setting with defense counsel and with constitutional protections presided over by a judge. But because the misdemeanor system has disinvested in those mechanisms of accountability and adversariality, in effect, it confers all that power on police to make that all-important initial decision. And so when we, when we over-police poor communities of color, those disparities translate throughout the rest of the criminal justice system. When police officers tell us that they're under pressure uh, from informal quotas in their departments to make more and more arrests in order to get promoted, those personnel policies, in effect, translate into criminalization. So I think we need to be far more attuned to just how important uh, the, the misdemeanor system is supposed to be in checking policing decisions and how it's really fallen down on that task. Alexandra Natapoff is author of Punishment Without Crime, How Our Massive Misdemeanor System Traps the Innocent and Makes America More Unequal. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast.